Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, Clear Shooting Magazine editor Wesley Stanton is decoying pigeons with our resident expert Geoffrey Garrard. Plus Byron shows us his favoured way to zero a rifle. We're in Essex once more with pigeon shooting guru Jeff Garrard. Today's guest of honour is Wes Stanton. Well, we're on the edge of a rape field again, winter rape field that uh, that has failed, uh, and they've they've trimmed it off, ready to plough it up. But what's happening is the old rape is beginning to shoot again, so the pigeons are finding that, and also we're on the edge of a, of a new wood that's absolutely full of cherries, wild cherries. This year. I mean, considering the frost that we had in the springtime, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of wild cherries we've got here. And the pigeons, like the crows, they take a, take advantage of, of nature's what nature provides. So, yeah. Right from day one, uh, when the whirly bird was invented, I have used it twice, and yet yeah, they do work. Um, but I've shot a lot of pigeons in my time, what I call the old-fashioned way. You know, watch the flight line get your hide right and get your decoy pattern right and if the pigeons are coming to you you'll get them decoying in or you'll get them close enough to get a shot off at them and over the years it served me well and that's the way I'll continue to do it. Some days it, it comes off and some days it don't, that's just pigeon shooting. Fortunately uh, as we were setting up um, Wes managed to shoot a couple that were flying past so we literally started off with two dead birds that were shot this morning. Wes once shot Clares for England and he's keen to prove why. Luckily it doesn't take him long as one bird then another falls to a well-placed shot. With the first few in the bag, Wes has already worked up a hunger. We leave him to it while Jeff explains the shooting setup. Well we've just got a couple of mates. Uh, Pete's got uh, one of his mates come down as well and he's out with my young lad and uh, they're just out the other side of the wood and they're on a flight line going past a clump of trees um, which they're having a few shots as well so it's uh, it's all good fun it just keeps the pigeons on the move instead of having to put scarecrows out there we've got someone out there shooting them which is just keeping them off that field moving them about and uh, hopefully making there's another one going in the bag now took two shots but um, he's getting there we're not sure Wes will appreciate those words of encouragement, but Jeff proves he's not all talk by bagging a few birds of his own. Um, and the initial thoughts were that we can decoy a few pigeons onto the rape, but also we'll try and get a few crows that are in, in you know, he, eating off the cherries. Um, so far, we've it's worked on the pigeons but the crows have decided to go elsewhere. So it's thumbs up for the pigeons and thumbs down for the crows. And we're probably about halfway through the day now and we've got, I don't know, 40 or 50 pigeons out there. Um, they haven't actually decoyed for some reason or other. We've tried everything in my little book of tricks to, uh, to get them to decoy. Um, but the last sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, it's just shown there's signs of coming in there. There's one there now just about to um, and it's just shown signs that they're just beginning the decoy now. So hopefully, as the afternoon goes on, uh, the pigeons looking like they might start the decoy. And if that happens, uh, I'm pretty confident we're on for a good day today. Things are going well for our daring duo as the birds come in steadily, load ever closer by the decoys. <laughs> Jeff's semi-auto and Wes's over and under prove equally up to the task. Now all that's left to decide is which of them is a better shot. I've been pigeon shooting since I was a boy. Um, and uh, I don't get to do very much of it nowadays, seeing as uh, most of my 
Life is sitting behind a desk looking at spreadsheets. But my most memorable moment was my first pigeon when I would have been about 10 years old and I was using a Milbro loaded with a large stone and I managed to shoot a wood pigeon. It may have died of fright actually and, then, and I was, was utterly delighted and my mother cooked it for me and it, that was the most memorable uh, pigeon shooting expedition I had and then I moved on to um, uh, shotguns. I kind of cut out the air rifle thing, never really did that. And uh, one of the most exciting memories of my early youth was 1987. It was on the day of Live Aid, if you remember that. As most people remember that day because Bob Geldorf did wonderful things for charity. I remember it because I shot 72 pigeons that day. The gun I'm shooting today is a Moroku MK10 that I've owned since... Hang on, there's two pigeons just coming in. Come on. Uh, there weren't too many of these appeared in the UK market because it was originally a model uh, made for Australia. It's very similar to an MK70. And I paid the princely sum of 940 quid for it and I've had it 10 years. And these are another couple of wood pigeons just coming in now. And that's a right and a left, thank you very much. Today's been uh, pretty good. We're in the middle of a heat wave. This morning we, we saw plenty of birds about and Jeff put out a uh, credible decoy pattern and made uh, an excellent hide with uh, added touches of a few uh, cherry branches. Um, and although we had a few come near the decoys, it was a bit slow to start with, but as the day's gone on, they've flown back to the wood they're roosting at and they're coming back out. They're, they're starting to come into the decoys <laughs> quite consistently. And we've not seen them come in, in big numbers, but there've been ones and twos and threes and fours steadily all afternoon. So it's been pretty good. I'm not sure how many we'll pick up at the end of the day, but I think we might be touching a hundred. Today has been a really, really bright day and um, I always shoot in glasses, but the ones I'm wearing today are a pair of uh, Zeiss uh, competition shooting glasses. These are a, a, a dark lens and uh, they're polarised, so they're quite handy for fishing as well and they block out an awful lot of glare. What I like about them as well, they have these um, curled ear, ear pieces so they don't slip off. They've got an adjustable bridge so you can move them up and down as well. Um, and these were made to my own prescription. They're really good, they're light. And um, I, I use them both for uh, pigeon shooting and, uh, and competition shooting. The boys are doing a good job of controlling the pigeon population thanks to some sure shooting. It'll soon be time to tally up the final bag. The end result is what I was hoping for. Didn't quite get it in the way that I was hoping for. Um, finished up with 104, was it? 100... 104. We thought it was going to be 99, and then we forgot there was actually five in the hide that we left there from earlier, so uh, we were quite keen to get the uh, get over the century, as it were. But, yeah. yeah, pretty good day today. Yeah, it was, very good. Good shooting. Um, we didn't shoot very well to start with both of us. I think it was because they weren't decoying, we was just trying to reach that little bit further for to try and kill a few, to try and build the pattern up. Yeah, Jeff's conveniently forgetting that I shot the first seven <laughs> pigeons I saw, and he didn't. <laughs> what he is remembering is that I probably missed the next 20. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, that's right. In the afternoon, yeah. I think we both shot pretty well, not yeah. like our passes. And also, it's worth putting up with the heat today. That was another factor, because it has just been really sapping um, the heat. It's probably one of the hottest days of the year. Um, compared to the last time that we was out, um, when we were dodging the thunderstorms, um, today's been really hot. So one of the things that we have got to do fairly shortly is get all these birds down to the chiller, get the chiller on and chill them down ready for the game bill to pick up tomorrow. Jeff and Wesley there making decoying look easy. And now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. 
A single form will be used when applying for a firearm certificate and a shotgun certificate, replacing the two separate existing forms. The change was announced on the 7th of August by the Office of Public Sector Information. Barney White Spunner of the Countryside Alliance said the simplification was extremely welcome. The new form will come into use from the 1st of December. It's the glorious 12th. At the start of the grouse season, Basque says moors are reporting a good count, with prospects for a superb season ahead. Moorland gamekeeper Robin Varley explains the economic and environmental benefits of grouse shooting. The, the, the economic benefits of grouse shooting to the, um, to the local economy, it, it, it's immeasurable. Um, of course, the, gun, the guns that come to shoot spend money here, but by spending money on the grouse shooting, the, the boss then has the, has the funds to invest in the dry stone walls, the footpaths, the styles, all the things that encourage the walkers and the general public to visit this, this beautiful area. In turn, they then spend money in the local economy. So basically, it's, it's immeasurable what grouse shooting brings in. An air gun open day organised by the Wellies Project gave people recovering from mental illnesses the chance to enjoy a day's shooting. The open day was one of the many events organised by Wellies that seeks to offer a therapeutic and morale building experience in a relaxed rural setting. The event gave participants the chance to shoot targets across four ranges, using both air pistols and rifles, with supervision and tuition from experienced professionals. There was strong industry support for the event, with representatives from Armex and Nightsight in attendance. Measures to control greylag geese in Orkney will increase, as Scottish National Heritage tries to reduce their effects on farming. As part of the project, 3,191 geese were shot in 2012. But the number of greylag geese in Orkney reached a critical level last year, and the cull target this season is 5,500. And finally, George Digweed has won the ICTSF World Sporting Championship in Canada. It was a successful trip for British shooters, as Richard Folds finished runner-up and Nick Hendrick placed third overall. George's World Championship win is his second of the year, along with two European championships. Graham Sturzacker won the Veterans category and Tim Webster top juniors. England also won every team competition. George told Clay Shooting Magazine, I'm very pleased to have won the World Championships. It's been my best year ever and I couldn't be happier. It was a tough course and nobody was going to shoot 100 straight, but you need events like that sometimes. It was a World Championship after all. Read the full story in next month's Clay Shooting. That was the Shooting Show News. Today we're going to take a look at how to zero your rifle, but more specifically than that, what height to zero your rifle in at at 100 yards, or what the equivalent range of that is. Now it might be quite surprising for some to find, that this really is a very important aspect of setting up your kit. And to get the most out of your rifle and the calibre that you're using, it really is very important. The first thing that we are going to do in order to get this whole thing set up and running is we're going to put the rifle and the ammunition over the chronograph and get ourselves an average reading and once we've got that we can plug this data into our ballistic tables and have a look at bullet drop out 150, 200 and 250 meters and from there we'll start to digest the information and take it back to 100 and see what that really means. These velocities are consistent with what I got last time I put this ammunition through my rifle. Um, I have put 10 shot strings through it before and averaged the velocities. The couple of shots that we've taken today are not really enough to get a proper average, but fortunately I already had the information in my head. And these average at about 2,812 feet per second. So now we've got that, we're going to plug it into the same Swarovski Blissix app that we've used previously just for ease of use and from there we'll get to see what the bullet drop is all about. Now before I came down to the range I took the liberty of producing a little spreadsheet with the information outputted um, from the ballistic app. 
just for ease of use. And on here, I have the equivalent zero height at 100 yards and what the downrange ballistics that correlate to that are. And from here, we're able to tell quite an interesting story. But what we're first going to do is I want to know what settings on my elevation turret I need to get a half inch, a one inch, and a one and a half inch high zero at 100 yards. So I'm just going to settle down and shoot these and take a quick note. And then from there, we can shoot these out at extended ranges and see what this means for bullet drop as we start pushing the range. Well, that's worked out quite well. You can see my three shots here. I know they're slightly strong at an angle, but I don't think that's anything untoward. It's the odd gust of wind coming in from time to time and it's just catching the bullets, I think. But I know where my elevation turret needs to be set for my half inch, one inch, and one and a half inch zero at 100 yards. And with those, we can now start pushing the range out and get to grips with exactly how crucial it is to get your zero height at 100 yards, which is the range that most people zero their rifles at, correct in order to make the most of the caliber that you're using. Before we do any more shooting, let's talk about what we're trying to achieve here. We want to set this rifle up in a way that is most appropriate for the hunting at hand. So if we take row stalking example, which is most of the hunting that I do, most shots are taken at less than 200 yards. So you want to set this rifle up in a way that out to 200 yards, you don't really have to think about where you're putting the bullet. You just put the crosshairs in the same place, pull the trigger, and the deer should drop. But to do that, we need to obviously look at kill zones. And we're going to be using a bag of flour for our kill zone. This is roughly measures four inches down by seven inches across. And that pretty much encompasses the lungs and heart of a roe deer. If you can burst the bag of flour, you'll be dropping your deer. And now that we have this in mind, we need to look at the ballistic data that has been outputted and see exactly what this means for being able to aim in the same place and drop your deer within the kill zone. If we take a zero of 100 yards, so our bullet's landing slap in the middle of the bull at 100, this will equate to a 3.3 inch bullet drop at 200 yards. So obviously, if you're taking a shot in the center of our bag of flour, this is going to equate to a miss. And the same is also true of a half inch high zero at 100 yards. If we skip up to a one and a half inch high zero at 100, the bullet drop at 200 is only 0.8 of an inch. So you're obviously going to manage to burst the bag. And if we move back to 100, because it's only 1.5 inches high, you're going to hit somewhere up here. So it's still within the kill zone. So you can understand now, seeing it a bit more visually, why it is not necessarily a good idea to zero your rifle right bang on at 100 yards. Because if you do need to take extended range shots, it means that you're going to have to start to compensate. But within the kill zone, you can get away with actually zeroing your rifle a bit high and you'll still be in the kill zone at close ranges and slightly further ranges. And with all that said, we're going to take a shot out at 200 yards so you can see the bullet drop. With the exception of one shot, which I knew I had snatched as soon as I pulled the trigger, which landed here, the other three shots are pretty much where I was expecting them to be strung out along the vertical line, fractionally to the right, but there is a very slight breeze running left to right. What we'll do is we'll take this back to where we're shooting from and see how that correlates to what we did earlier when we were zeroing the rifle at 100 yards, but at different heights. And hopefully we'll get a slightly better understanding of how this whole thing comes together. With the 100 and 200 yard targets in my hand, it's quite easy to see what a difference just a couple of clicks can make at 100 yards once you start pushing the range out. Taking a look at the 200 yard target, you can see my first shot is 0.8 of an inch low. And this corresponds to the one and a half inch high zero at 100 yards. Second shot, 1.8 inches low, corresponds to the one inch high zero. And finally, three and a half inch low shot just here corresponds to the half inch 
high zero at 100 yards. Now these are obviously not exactly what the data outputted, but these are single shots. And if I had shot a group and average of the height, you probably would have ended up with something slightly closer to the ballistic data. But it proves a point and shows you visually exactly what's happening once you start extending the range out, depending on your zero height at 100. And I think with that, it's quite easy to agree that it's not necessarily a good idea to zero your rifle in bang on at 100 yards. And there is definitely some benefit to a little bit of height at 100 or the equivalent range that you're zeroing the rifle in so that you don't have to do any compensation once you start pushing the range out. So with that in mind, we're going to take some flower bags as the kill zones. I'm going to put them out at different ranges and I'm going to do a bit of shooting, taking my shots right in the center of the flower bags just to show you what it means to get the rifle set up exactly right. Well, there you go, out to 215 yards, aiming in exactly the same place, in the centre of the flower bag, some very successful kill shots. Now, depending on what you're hunting, you're probably going to want to tweak that a bit. If you were shooting foxes, the target area is a lot smaller, and a one and a half inch high zero at 100 is probably going to be a bit too much. And I've certainly seen it in the field before, where people have their rifles zeroed too high at the closer ranges, and you end up shooting over the top of something, especially when it's a small quarry like a fox. But really, what this should do is encourage you to go and experiment. Go to the range, have some fun, set your zero at one inch high at 100 and see what that corresponds to in terms of the ballistic data. And set your rifle up so that it gives you the best chance to do some accurate shooting when you're out in the field. Well that's it for this week, thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.